All right. Good morning, uh, Hail Community. Today we've got joining us Jason Kadee. Now, Jason has been a professional basketballer for the better part of pretty much most of his career. Um, at the moment, he's at the Brisbane Bullets, also spent a long time with the Sydney Kings and has represented Australia and played for the Boomers uh, in the last couple of years as well. So, Jason, thanks for joining us, giving us a little bit of time today. Thanks for having me. Well, good. So joining us here also, I've got our two vice captains of basketball. I've got Kai O'Donoghue, who's way up north in our state, and Eddie, who's, I think, really close to Hales, about 500 metres away from where I am. So, um, boys, I'm going to throw over to you um, just to learn a little bit more about Jason's career. Too easy. Um, so, hey, Jason, how you going? Good, mate. Nice to meet you, somewhat, anyway, online. Yeah, it's good. What was that? Sorry. Said it's nice to meet you, not in person, but online still counts. Yeah, still counts, exactly. Gotta, it's what you got to do during these tough times. Truth. Yeah, so um, so born in the western suburbs of Sydney, you attended Westfield Sports High School. Is that correct? Yep, I uh, did all. So basically, um, did, yeah, year, six through to, uh, year seven through to year 12 all at Westfields. Um, Pretty lucky. I, I went there like in year seven for basketball, and all the kind of group I went in with, who I kind of knew a little bit through family, friends, and stuff. Uh, we all were there for basketball, and we stayed there that whole time. You sit seven to twelve. We were all there, and we're still all friends. So I was pretty lucky to have that friendship group from that point forward. Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah, sounds sounds good. Um, and it also said you got into the Westfield Sports Hall. Of Fame. Was that for basketball? Yeah, so um, it, it wasn't really a thing, I guess, when I was at school because it just it was kind of – so we have a physio. So where our stadium was, there was a physio connected to it and they've got pictures of everyone that's been – that's gone through the school and got entered in the Hall of Fame all through the, the foyer of it. And so you see all these faces and names and um, – uh, your Michael Clark, your Harry Kules, like all these people that just come before and all these really cool athletes in a way. And so for me, getting announced in it actually kind of surprised me because I didn't regard myself as one of those. But it's something that um, I guess now as you get a bit older, it's something that you can look back on and, and find as a pretty cool moment. And um, to be up on the wall with people like that, it, as much as I'm not, I don't regard myself as an athlete like they are, but it's still pretty cool to, to be a part of it. Uh, so when you were announced for the Hall of Fame, it surprised you then, would you say? Yeah, I was in Sydney at the time, so I was playing for the Kings. And I, um, I, got, a, I got a call. So I, I still spoke and still speak to a few teachers and so on from back there, and my coach is still there. And um, I got a call just saying, I, I thought it was just a catch-up, and then they just said, oh, would I like to come into the school? Um, and, and talk at assembly, and I said, "Yeah, that's no problem at all." And um, oh, yeah. and then as I was there, they presented me with a jersey, and um, yeah, and announced it. So it was yeah, it was pretty cool for me. Oh yeah, right. Ed, like... all right, I'll take this one. Um, so you also spent a lot of time at the AIS, which has been an important step for a lot of other uh, Australian basketball players. So what was your time there like? It was a um. I don't know if you'd say a wake-up call, but it, it was a, a early introduction into what it takes to be a serious athlete and an elite athlete. I um, I went in as a 17-year-old. I played all my rep stuff, grew up in Sydney, played it all at Bankstown, was just around friends and family. And I was fortunate because my mum and dad both played for Australia and my dad was a CEO of the NBL team at the time called the West Sydney Razorbacks. You boys would be too young for that. but So I was around um, them. So I was around them for since I was seven years old. I was around an NBL team. So I got to see the ins and outs. But then when I got to the AIS, I was around kids my own age, maybe a year older, maybe a year younger. And we were going every day. We were lifting. We were doing nutrition stuff. We were doing recovery. Even though I hated it, we were still getting ice baths and things. And I, I was I learned the whole different side to, to becoming a professional athlete than what I was doing at home, even though I thought I was still doing a lot. And I was. But it, it really opened my eyes up to what goes on and what you have to do to become a, a professional. And just not even a professional, but what you have to do to be really good at it. Mm. Yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's cool. That's really good insight. Um, 
And so then out of school, uh, you represented Australia um, in the under 19s, under 21s at a national level. So what sort of memories do you have of those tournaments and what did it feel like to represent your country? Um, surreal. It's, it's, it's one of those things that I've started to describe. It's like if you could imagine playing for a team and it being like it just is surreal. It's always like you're playing in, a, in an outfit that's bigger than you and it's like you're representing people. Like if I'm playing for the Bullets, I feel like I'm just playing for myself and maybe my family and whatnot. But when you play for Australia, I feel like I'm representing people that coached me when I was younger, people that I played with. I just, you feel like you're representing more than just yourself because of the meaning of the jersey. And to do it, so I was, um, I was still in the under 19s when I got to play for the Boomers for the first time. So it was a pretty whirlwind 12 months. So as you said, going to the AIS, I went to the AIS and I'd only, when I went to the AIS, I just started being pretty good at nationals and things and, and having some big games and so on. I got to the AIS and that was the year of the under 19 world champs. So in, I got there in January. In April, we went away to France. And that was my first ever tournament for the Australian team. It was the under-19s. It was our pre-Worlds tournament. And so I was just trying to make the under-19 Worlds team. That was all I was focused on. I was a young kid learning what I said at the AIS, how it all works. And then I got back from France and I got a call from our head coach, Marty Clark, saying, um, you'll be in the boomers camp this week. And I was I thought he was joking. But so me, Matthew Delavadova, Cody Ellis, Brock Modem, and I think one other, we got to go into this boomers camp. And so it was a rather large camp. It was my first taste of senior. It all happened so quick that I was in the senior program as well. And um, from that point on, it kind of all just steamrolled. I, I went to the under-19 world champs in June of that year or July. And then on the back of that, I got to go to South America and play in a home series against Argentina with the boomers team. So it, it was a pretty whirlwind eight or nine months. and. It was something now looking back, um, it, it was definitely a cool period because I was just, I was so young and experiencing so much. I got to travel the world and do all this different stuff in, the, in nine months. And before that, I'd only really been on a USA trip with the family. So it was, um, it was pretty cool, but it all happened very, very fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, let me uh, chime in here with a, a question, Jason. So we spoke to Sean Reddidge the other day. Um, who participated in the 2008 Olympics. And we asked him about the passion. I think it was a young Andrew Bogut, young Paddy Mills, young Joe Ingalls. Um, you know, and the, the passion they have now for representing their country and how their leadership can be traced back to when they were younger. In your experience with the team, what does it mean to have those, you know, I mean, the biggest players in the country, even though they're not playing, show, show so much passion in the Australian jersey? It, it's, it's awesome to see. And I think it comes back to... The world we live in now and the sport we play, as much as I love it, it's a business. And so you have what we do in the NBL. People love playing basketball, don't get me wrong. And people love being, I love competition. I love teammates and I love that whole side of it. But the loyalty side in sport is, it, it's hard because it's, it's a two-way street, right? You could do really well in a team that says, no, nah, we've had enough, that's it. And so there's a lot of things that come into it when you get to the business side of it. And I think the one thing the Australian team does, especially for those guys, because if you think about what I just spoke about, and now it times out by 20, 30, 30, with these guys, millions and millions and millions of dollars at stakes as they play overseas, there's so much stress in that side to it where I feel like for Australia, they get to come back and just be themselves. They get to play with their friends. You spoke about the AIS. Paddy and those guys went to the AIS together. There's that common bond, I think, and friendship and experience of playing for something greater than yourself. And, and it's a loyalty thing too, I think, because we're all loyal to our country. We love where we're from. We love being Australian. We love being from Perth, Sydney, wherever it is. And I think that yeah. those guys have that natural instinct that when they get the chance to come home and play together for Australia, it, it, it represents something bigger than themselves. And it's not about money and all this other side of things. And I just think... That, that factor, it takes you back to being young. It takes you back to yeah. when you could just play and have fun with your mates and love what you did with everyone around. Mm, mm. And now we've talked about a few of the highlights of your career, but no doubt every professional sportsman has a few hurdles and a few hiccups. Was there a particular period of your career? You mentioned that 18 months, which was probably just positive after positive after positive. 
um, experience. Was there a period that was the opposite of that where you started doubting yourself? And what advice would you give to aspiring kids like these two that, um, you know, on how to handle those periods? Um, yeah, there's been a, a couple of them, but as you said, it was positive after positive after positive, and then uh, eight months later, I had a car accident. Um, so I, I went through that year, um, all that stuff. I um, went through a decision where I had to choose whether I wanted to go to college or stay in Australia and play in the NBL. I chose to stay in Australia and play in the NBL. Uh, after the playing those games for Australian stuff, there was a lot of positive things. I got to go and play in the Nike Hoop Summit where I made the world team to play against the top USA high school kids with the likes of Kyrie Irving, Harrison Barnes, a bunch of names that you'd all know now. And then two months later, I got in a car accident where I got hit by a semi-trailer, broke my pelvis, and basically got told that I wouldn't play basketball for at least eight to 12 months. And so I, at that time, being young, kind of was naive to it all and just thought, oh, I'll be fine, like, I whatever. And kind of, I did get back really quick. I played my first NBL game five and a half months later. But yeah. I struggled to sometimes walk after games or after trainings. I had days when my body just couldn't go because my hips and all through that area would shut down. I really, as an 18-year-old kid, had to learn how to figure my body out, understand what it was telling me, understand what I needed. And... I still wouldn't say I'm the greatest at it, but I felt like I got taught so much in that space of time as a young kid of what I needed to do and what works best. And sometimes it actually is about saying, oh, hang on a second, I need to have a break here. I need a day off. I can't, I can't do that and sustain that level and play on weekends. And so I got taught a lot after that. I should have probably died that day and was lucky enough to still be here now. And that was definitely one of the rougher times from that kind of experience, but also little things like, a couple of years ago, I moved to Brisbane from Sydney. Probably underestimated how big of a move that was. It was the hardest decision I had to make in my professional career of leaving Sydney to come to Brisbane. And Sydney's home and I have my friends and family and all around. And I would kind of set myself up as kind of one of the names of the Sydney Kings. And everyone, I was a hometown guy and all that side of things. And so to leave there, I probably undersold how much of a toll it would take on me. And so... Coming to Brisbane, expectations got caught into kind of doing a lot for other people and forgot about myself along the way and had to kind of figure out who I was and, and how I get back to being myself playing basketball. And so I, through that time, I guess I've always been a big people person and I relied upon some people around me to kind of just talk and have honest conversations and just get back to having fun. I feel like if you start to lose the fun and the enjoyment out of things, then it, it, it gets hard. and um, a big reason why we all play sport or do something or participate in stuff is so that we can enjoy and have fun. And I think um, I, I grew to find that, that, that side of it again and it helped massively going forward. Yeah, and I appreciate those, those insights and showing a bit of vulnerability there because I, mean, I think we all, we all go through that and the boys will eventually, everyone listening will eventually have those periods themselves. Um, Kai, do you want to go on? Yeah, I was just going to say yeah, to that. Yeah, um, I might just come back in here. Sorry, Go on, Jason. Go on. Um, um, I would be letting down the thousand-odd boys listening to this. If I didn't ask you about that crazy night in 2018 when you were playing for the Boomers against the Philippines in Mani Manila. And Manila. Oh, hell broke loose on the court. And... Manila, oh, my bad, Manila, and um, you were actually on the court when the when it all started, like the fight and everything. What are your recollections from the few minutes and then the aftermath? And have you been? It would have been surreal at the time to a degree, wouldn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, I remember the whole thing very, very well. Um, it was crazy to be honest, and uh, we. We kind of had to stay quiet because there were sanctions and things going on. But a lot of a lot of what happened was it started a while before that because we beat them in Melbourne. And it was in Melbourne, but it was a strong Filipino crowd. There was a lot of people there. And it was, um, it was probably more of a Filipino home game than it was an Australian. Mm. But we beat them quite comfortably. And I remember after the game, there was a few articles. We hadn't lost since we moved to Asia. And 
they come out saying all this stuff about beating us and that they were going to beat us and blah, 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 blah. Wait till they come over to the Philippines and, and all this stuff. And I was just like, oh, whatever. And then so when we played and we'd lost to Japan two nights earlier in Japan. It was our first loss. Uh, Delhi and Thon Maker had come to play with us. It was just, it kind of was a wake up call a little bit because we just rolled through Asia so easily. And then, so there was a bit of fire in the belly and people like Delhi and that obviously don't take losing very nicely. And they felt like coming into our group and we hadn't lost, they were part of the reason. And so anyway, we go to the Philippines, basically with just a job to do. We, we were in there to just win by a lot and get after it and play really well because we didn't the night before. And that's exactly what we did. We were playing very good basketball. There was 40,000 people there watching or something crazy. It was wild atmosphere. And all that happened was we were just, we were too good for them at the time. And so the things started to happen. They started to, after half time, when it started to get away from them, they started to do little things and poke and pinch and talk a bit of crap and whatnot. And then I subbed in. I think thinking about halfway through the third quarter when it started to get a bit chippy and uh, Chris Golding turns to me and goes, bro, be careful. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, man, this guy's carrying like an idiot. And he pointed to the guy next to him. And I was like, what's his problem? And he's like, oh, I don't know, mate, but you just probably can't handle losing. So there's a bit of that going on. And at the time, Chris Golding was absolutely rolling too. Rolling. And... Uh, one thing led to another. Chris kept hitting, hitting shots, telling the bloke about it. The bloke kept trying to pinch and do silly stuff like that. And then next minute, it just exploded out of nowhere. And all I remember was just, uh, if you could ex think about just being on a court and then all you see is blue T-shirts, that's all I could see at one <laughs> stage. It was just like something happened and then there was just a million blue T-shirts running around and it was just, it was absolutely wild. Jeez, that would have been... Fun experience. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like just at the time, like I just remember thinking on the court, I seen heaps of blue t-shirts and in my mind, I was just like, where are the gold singlets? I need to get them out of here. Like we just need to get all gold singlets back towards our area. We were like, is the crowd going to leave? Is it, like you just, you didn't know what was going to happen. And then right after the, the it kind of all got split up and whatnot, our whole bench, we just wanted to get out of there because there was so many. There was because I remember when it was still happening, there were bottles being thrown and stuff, and we just thought, what? What about if all these fans just start flooding the court? It'd be a disaster. And so I know for us, we were just kind of like, they all left the bench. They so have to call it off. Um, mm. Hopefully, we can just get back to the change room and get out of here as quick as possible. Yeah. At, at then, what point did you? I imagine at some point you got back to your hotel, you got your phone on, and it, it just would have lit up. Yeah, I mean, it made international news within an hour, I reckon, on, on social media. Like, wh when's the first time you saw the, the replay footage and go, holy crap, what, what just happened? So, so they, the game continued, and then the Philippines blokes walked up. I said to the boys when we walked out the court, I said, listen, as much as we knew that that wasn't on us, we didn't start or instigate anything. I said, mm. we go shake hands with whoever's left, shake hands with the coach, get this crap over and done with so we can get the hell out of here. That was basically the approach. So yeah. we go in after that, they said they were going to foul out so they disqualified or whatever. So they did that. We walked straight out to the change room. Uh, the four boys that had been ejected were sitting there. And then we got to, like, there was police, security, everything around us. They just ushered us into the change room. We sat in there for about two and a half hours. Wow. So we were in the change room forever because they wanted everyone to leave the stadium and be clear of the stadium before they put us on a bus. And while this was happening, obviously, I didn't know, we didn't know the extent of the media side of things yet. We'd yeah. obviously, our phones were on it. So we could see Twitter and Instagram and we, we obviously, we were all watching the video in there together. Mm. And um, it was just a weird time. And they were telling us at the time, they're sorting out hotels and things. So... We were staying at the same hotel as the Filipino team and everyone knew where we were staying. So what had happened is the Australian consulate had organised for us to go and stay at the hotel that the Prime Minister would stay at if he was over there or any government officials. So in that whole time, we got moved to hotels. So when we finished, we went directly to that new hotel. We all sat in a room together, ordered room service, had a couple of beers together. And, just <laughs> and then... Uh, the next day, we were out. So our staff went and got our bags from the hotel at about 3 a.m., brought our stuff back. In the morning, we woke up, 
we had a meeting now and we knew how worldwide had gone about what the process was. And then they'd organized for us at the airport that people took our bags before us. And then we got to the airport in, we just wore regular clothes and we walked straight onto the plane. So it wow. was, it was, yeah, it was crazy. It was one of the wildest times of my life. Yeah. The craziness. Yeah. yeah. Kaya, do you want to go? Better would have been. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, we also talk a fair bit here about, like here at Hale, about what it takes to be a team player. So in your long career, is there any player that stands out where you just think, like, my goodness, this guy is just on a different level in terms of his, like, unselfishness and his team first mentality? Um, there's been a few. I actually, as I've got older, I don't normally say a lot of things about myself, but I feel like that's one thing that I've, um, I guess I, I pride myself on. I feel like I'm a very team person. I worry about other people for myself. Uh, for example, this year we had the chance to get Stobes. I was a big part of that. I still spoke to Stobes every day in the off season trying to get him to Brisbane. Knowing that it probably mean I didn't start, I knew I'd still play, but I just knew that it mean might mean I didn't start. And so for me, I didn't care because I just want to win. And so I, I feel like I've always based. I love playing basketball with good players. So if you have to sacrifice a bit for yourself, I feel like at the end of the day, if you sacrifice some stuff, you're going to get it back in other ways. And so I definitely think I actually, I'll put myself forward for this. And I'll also say a guy like Kevin Lish, uh, Kev. MVP of the league, won numerous titles, played in Perth. You've probably all seen him. He, he was just incredible. The competitiveness, the toughness he played with. And then I remember one day at training when I was in Sydney, me and Kev, we used to wear these heart rate monitors and these, all this tracking thing. And everyone's load management used to get to about five, 600. One day me and Kev was close to 1,000. We were going that hard at each other. I seen him kick a ball for the first time in my life. And then... I think like an hour later at weights, he apologized to me because he th thought he was a bit too uh, like out of it. I was like, Kev, are you serious? But he, this is the guy that would compete so hard. He was the nicest guy ever. But then would also, six months later, he got injured and uh, he was coming back from injury. He told Andrew Gaze, no, let Jason start. He's been playing really well. I'm happy to come off the bench. And I was like, that makes no sense. You're a former MVP. But it just showed the kind of guy he is. Whilst the competitor is, you just there's there's a few people like that. It's very rare, and that doesn't mean people are selfish, but it's very rare to find people like that who are, are willing to to really give up stuff for the group. And yeah. when you do have them, yeah. you need to really utilize it and also make sure people pay attention to it and give it the respect it deserves. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Well said. Um, so you would have played in a few of the NBA times NBL matches over the last few seasons. Um, what were these experiences like and was there one that sticks out to you? Yeah, it was, um, I only got to play in one. I played against Utah. We were the first ever game that played it, that played. And it was, it was one of the moments where you walk out and you're just kind of like what's going on like it just it seems surreal because we were playing against these guys that you just watch on tv in their arena uh, there was a for our game there was eighteen thousand people there because it was their first preseason game and uh it was just one of those moments as you were playing it just kind of felt like it just happened the game was over and then you were sitting in the locker room after like what just happened and it was something that i'll always remember just because of the how cool. It was just a, it was a cool moment at the end of the day. Like you just look at things and you think, yeah, that was pretty cool, and that was definitely one of them. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And also, what would be a bit of advice you would give your seventeen-year-old self as an inspire as an aspiring athlete who wanted to make it to the top? Advice I'd give myself. Um, I, I would probably say to myself, don't ever read anything that someone says is something about you. Don't ever listen to people you don't know. Um, keep surrounding yourself. I, I've always done it, but I would repeat it to myself then. Surround yourself with good people who you trust. And that can go from teachers to coaches to teammates to friends. 
And I, I truly do believe that the better people you have around you, especially when I was younger, I had great people around me, the better decisions you make, you hang out with better people, you put yourself in a better position to succeed in whatever it is you do. And you also get people that are willing to, to give up stuff for you and help you do stuff. And I think when you actually got people around you that will tell you how it is, for the betterment of you, not to try and enhance their own chances or to do something like that. And it, it can only help you going forward and also can help you help other people, which I think is a big part of growing up and a big part of sport. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, so just a few quick questions to finish off with, I guess, because um, we've got to wrap up pretty soon. But who's the best player you've played against, Yuri? Best player I've played against? Um... He was young, but Kyrie, Harrison Barnes and Kyrie Irving were pretty good back then. Um, but oh, yeah, I mean, I've played against some guys that were really, really good. They're really, really good now, and they were kind of good then. So it's kind of that hard mix of remembering how good they were then. But um. Yeah, let's go with, uh, I'll go with Kyrie Irving. Yeah, okay. And then to flip that around, who's the best player you played with or alongside? Um, also a few. Uh, if I was to go NBL, Kev Lish is probably one of them. Purely off what I said before, or what he did for the group. But also, I mean, um, I've played with guys like and been at camp with Joe Ingles and Andrew Berg and Patty Mills and these kind of guys. And you can just really... Um, see what they bring to a group uh, at camp. Ben Simmons came in for a day, and I was on his team that day, and it was pretty, pretty good. So I'd actually even say him just for one training session of training with him. He was um, impressive and very, very good at basketball. Oh, fantastic. So, Jason, I'll ask you the last question, which is really left field, but Kai is a border. Um, and a bit of background that here at Hale, Tuesdays is pie day. So the 200 boarders get given a range of pies. The staff get pies. And some of the stuff that the boarders do with their pies, I can see Kai smiling here, is it's just not, to me, it's just not appropriate. Like they take the roof off the pie. They, they put sauce in. Some of them eat it with a spoon. Some eat it with a fork. Yeah. Some just eat the roof. How does Jason Kadee eat a meat pie? I've, I've seen all this before because my sister is one of those and I'm just the regular <laughs> grab the meat pie and eat it as is. If it's too hot, I might peel the, the roof off a little bit just to get some air in, but I'm exactly. just normally straight up, just eat it how it is and that's how it goes. Well, Kai, do you want to exactly. share how you eat it? It's the first time I've asked you, how do you eat a meat pie, Kai? Yeah, well, the hail ones are so hot. like they, they legit burn to just eat normally, so you have to take the roof off to cool it down. <laughs> oh, fair enough now Jason um, really appreciate giving up a bit of time mate I was just a cold email and um, you know, I mean, it's very generous of you you know this is going to be distributed to hundreds and hundreds of boys that are kind of stranded at home without sport at all and um, it's an inspiring story both the, the ups of it and the few hurdles you hit and what you've done and I'm sure there's still a lot more to come so wishing you and your family great health in the next couple of weeks and months and hopefully we'll see you back out there pretty soon no, nah, thanks for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. And yeah, everyone out there, just look after yourself, your family, and hope we get this through these next few months and we get back to playing basketball and sport. Perfect. Thanks, yeah. mate. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers Jason. Jason.